Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Lady CEO Show, uh, Realtor Edition with your host. That's me. I'm Jessica Stroud. And today I have my very, very, very special friend, Mary Drake. Mary and I actually live in the same area. We go to drinks together. We go to coffee together. We do amazing, we do amazing things together. She is one of my personal friends. One of my one of my girl pals, and I'm excited for you to hear her story. I'm excited for you to hear about how she, honestly, how she gets it all done. So that's that's the thing. Before right before I started recording, we were just talking about that. You so many realtors struggle with having a life, and I want you to hear how she got the life that she has. Because while she does run a team that does over 30 million a year, uh, she still goes to the lake and she still spends time with her kids and she still spends time with her husband. Mary, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Jessica. And I can just put it like the same uh, level of admiration for Jessica. I have had the amazing opportunity to work with her professionally and then um, just really feel strongly that she is an amazing human being, a wonderful friend. And I have been passing out her book like crazy. <laughs> so, and I took her to my biggest networking group and introduced her and she was a phenomenal speaker. So if any of you are looking for that, but uh, Jessica is your gal. Um, I, I, I am available for speaking engagements. Thank you for saying that. And I, I do have a number one best selling book. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> I will tell you that I got over 20 texts that she was the best speaker that my women's business networking group has had. So No, you did not. Yes, I did. Wow. Yes. See, I didn't even know that. See, that's a true friend right there. Come, yes. You come on my podcast and you're plugging me when I'm trying to yes. plug you. <laughs> yeah, so just so you know, this is a mutual admiration here. We, um, totally, we totally crush it on each other. Yeah, so I am, I run, uh, co-lead the Beginnings KC real estate team with Tina Rowe. We are um, powered by Remax Heritage in Lee Summit, Missouri. We have had the number one Remax team in Lee Summit for the last two years running. So, uh, and we wow. have a total of four agents on our team and a full-time licensed client care coordinator. So there is a total of seven of us. Wow, that's pretty tight. That's a pretty tight team. We are. We are a very, by design, small but mighty. And that would probably be by my design, mostly. I have yeah. no grand illusions of, and I'm not saying, it, you know, that's a bad thing to have a big team, but I have no grand illusions of managing that many people. Mm -hmm. And um, our team has grown just by people only reaching out to us. We have never recruited. They have specifically said that they wanted to be on our team. And, you know, we are very, very slow to hire and quick to let go. I hate to say the word fire because that's always been a mutual decision. We've only had that happen once in 10 years. So when I say that we are slow and the last agent that we brought on, I'm still a little bit on the fence because um, he happens to be my husband. <laughs> So he's still in the trial uh, stage, but so how long have you been in real estate? I have been in real estate. I got my license and it's, I'm going on by this fall. It will be 11 years. Oh, okay. So and why, I, why did you get into real estate? Really kind of by default. I was a stay at home mom for 18 years. Yeah. I found myself a single mom with five kids. Um, seven to 16 years old. And I, um, I needed to go back to work. I have a degree in occupational therapy, but my degree was a bachelor's from, and that degree has become a master's plus it's on its way to a doctorate degree. So I was looking at going back to um, school full time. Plus I had, at the time I had four teenagers and a seven and a half year old that had a health issue. So going back to work in a hospital clinical environment and try and figure out, have some flexibility. I even looked at, and I tell people this, I even looked at going to law school and I was told by UMKC that I was not a likely candidate even for the five-year program without any family in town to help wow. me. 
So um, I looked at a lot of different options and then someone reached out to me and said, hey, what do you think about going into real estate? I heard you were divorced. And I was like, well, I like houses. Is, I'm sorry, is divorce a requirement? <laughs> No, but I was like, I think she thought, you know, I needed to get a job. So, I was like, okay. And I know, and that's exactly what she said to me. And I was, I was like, hey. And she, and I thought to myself, well, I've lived in houses, I've built a couple houses, and I'm a super organized person. Just a kind of anal retentive. Like when I was a stay-at-home mom, I had an agenda, and I was the CEO of my home. We were very regimented family. So I was like, well, um, I'll look into that. And then I just decided, why not? It gives me, I thought, the flexibility. It is flexible, don't get me wrong. It is flexible around other people's schedules. But I got recruited to a team. At the same time, my business partner, Tina Rowe, was recruited to the same team. I am very grateful for that one year that we spent there. Tina's much smarter than I am. I'm more entertaining. <laughs> And she You're was so telling entertaining. Yeah. But <laughs> Tina just, it wasn't the right environment for the two of us. But I always tell people there's an equal lesson in learning what not to do. Mm, I mean, absolutely. Great, great marketing skills, great training, all of that. But there were some things, philosophy and integrity and things that didn't mesh with neither Tina or myself. So what was grown out of that is we both resigned within a year and I told her I needed to, and I'll bring in, you know, my personal part of my story is always my faith. I told her, I'm not going to talk to you for 90 days. I'm going to research what I want to do now. And I'm also going to pray about this. Hmm. And if I really feel strongly to stay in real estate, you'll give me the time in this space, then, you know, we'll talk. And again, I hadn't met her prior to that one year stint. And by design, I was at the office Monday, Wednesday, Friday. She was there Tuesday, Thursday. So we weren't together a whole lot, even though we were on the same team. And I went and did that research, soul searching and felt like, okay, she's somebody I think I can trust. And we just kind of fell forward. I called her up and said, it's been three months. I'm still gonna stay in this. I had some transactions going. And I said, let's work it out. So for a year and a half, it was just the two of us. And we're, Kind of, we went to a new brokerage that just opened, Remax Heritage, opened in Lee Summit. It was previously Remax Preferred. And we went here, came to this building with five people, and it's over 70 people now, thanks to our managing broker, Shayla Dean, who mm -hmm. I introduced you to. She's phenomenal. But Tina and I just kept falling forward. Our first agent that reached out to us to join our team was Shelby Tipton. She's awesome. Shelby brought on her son, Noah. Um, I remember in December of, it might have been, this is 21, December of 2007, 8, 17, probably, Alethea Beasley called me, and we were at a REMAX team convention, and she said, I asked all over, and people kept giving me your name to join your team. She has been an amazing addition to our team. Then we brought on, and my husband got his license, like I said, last fall and joined our team. And Laura Danner, our licensed client care coordinator came on, I believe in May, but we just kind of keep growing and keep moving. So that's kind of the history of Beginnings KC. So I love that you basically said, hey, uh, okay, I got into real estate. I'm not completely loving this, I need to take a step back and make sure that this is what I want to do. Yeah. I think that there are a lot of realtors right now that <clears throat> things have changed and they need to take a step back and say, is this really what, is this really what I want to do for another 10 years? Yeah. They need to give themselves the space. And then you came back and you're like, oh yeah, I'm told. Cause I feel like so many of them are half in half out. Like you're kind of in, but you're kind of out, which is a terrible experience for the client. So you gave yourself this space for 90 days. And then you said, oh yeah, I'm all in. I'm yeah. all in. Yeah. And then I have to make this work. And quite honestly, I put pressure on myself. Now, and I'm not saying this, as I financially was working through my divorce settlement, I gave myself a time and an end date 
where I needed to be financially independent completely within five years. So, uh, I mean, and so I had, I did that on purpose. I was like, I am not going to stay in this position where I am dependent on anybody else but myself. So I have to grow my real estate business to a significant income in a certain time frame. And that's just a personal, that's the way I operate. That's just for me. So I had no other options when I said I was all in. I was like, this, I'm going for this. And it's, hold, don't, don't try to hold me back. Mm -hmm. so, so I just, I did that willfully and purposefully at the time. So that was also something in going into business with Tina. I knew that she had the drive and the ambition. And when you have someone supporting you, but on the flip side, I also had a sick kid. And so I, I could not be an individual agent and grow my business and have four teenagers and a child that only went to school 50% of the time for a significant amount of time without having a backup plan because I still needed the money. So that was that having a teammate was born out of that necessity, but now I come to value that so much because I can take a step back and say, and we are such a cohesive group that we interface seamlessly. Almost every weekend of the summer, one of us is out of town. And a lot of times 50% of us are out of town. We highly value family and family time. And when I tell one of my teammates, if you write that contract while you're on family vacation, when you get back, I will take you out behind the shed and beat you. So, <laughs> and we have that conversation. You do not, yes, everybody feels like they have to take care of their clients, but if you train your team cohesively, one person can always step in and we don't end up bickering over whose commission that is. It, it, it comes out in the wash. There are times that one team member may elect to financially compensate someone else for a you know, significant time investment, but I would tell that is so, I don't even know if that happens once on an annual basis. We are here to cover one another. We're here to let our clients know, and we actually advertise that as a team. We interface seamlessly. I want you to know that if a property comes on the market, you are going to be able to get in that property because if I am on a showing with another client, I have six other people I can call. It sounds so professional to me, right? If you think about when you go to the doctor's office, oh, no, so-and-so isn't available today, but I can get you in with so-and-so, right? Yeah. Okay, well, if you want to wait for your doctor, okay, but I can get you in quicker with this other doctor if you really need in. Yeah, exactly. And they still, you still maintain your primary care physician. Right. You're right. the primary care real estate agent. And you're still going to be, you know, Alethea or Shelby or Andy's client. It's the important thing is unlocking the door to get you in. And based on their workload, there are times that, you know, I will be in Tina's dot loop doing a contract for her because we have that level of trust and we all know how we work together. Right now, as I'm on this podcast, pardon me, <clears throat> Tina is running our team meeting because it happens every <laughs> week. Because you're hanging out with me, right? Yeah. So I'll go back to it, but she's going to run, you know, our team meeting. And I am fully confident that the agenda she and I talked about is being covered there. So. I feel like so many realtors, they come out of the gate and, and they either you have success or you don't have success, all right? So let's talk about the ones that do have success. And they have an incredible amount of success and they can't sustain it. If I could just tell them all, all new agents one thing, I would just tell them the clients will come and go, but your family, your family should always be there, right? Your marriage or your relationships with your kids and the soccer games and the baseball games. And for me, the basketball and the football games, yeah. the clients will come and go, but you cannot sacrifice A, your family, B, your relationships, C, yourself. Actually, C should be first, self should be first. But I see so many of them sacrifice that because of the paycheck or the potential, the potential paycheck, the potential commission. 
Yeah, it's an odd job in that you don't get paid, you only get paid at the end and you invest all the hours. I'm not saying that there have been a lot of times that I work, 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 sometimes for years and don't get paid at all. But I will tell you, I've done a mind shift of there's a percentage of your time that's a loss. Be okay with that. Don't get too high with the really highs when you close a million dollar home so that you don't get too low when you lose the million dollar contract. So maintaining a level of this is great and I'm grateful for it when it does come, but don't get too attached to it when it falls through. And that does happen. The other is that thing just is your self-talk or how do you do that? I love that. Uh, it's a, it, it is a self-talk. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, when you want to, you know, fist pump yourself or high five yourself or chest bump yourself, I'm like, go easy, girl, go easy. Don't get too high so that when the flip side happens, don't get too low. And so my self-talk is hold everything literally like this. And I'm holding my, both of my hands, palms wide open. It can sit there and it can stay there and you can hold it up, but you're not hanging on with a tight grip. And then you're not too sad when things don't go your way and you're not over elated when they do. So um, that has been a shift and thinking about the percentage of time that's a loss and being okay with that. Everybody has that. It, whether you're a plumber and you go and bid a job and somebody hires a different plumber or you're a hairdresser and somebody comes in for one highlight and never comes back, everybody has a percentage of loss. It's just generally speaking, real estate agents invest a lot before they of their time and energy before they get paid. So understanding that's the nature of the business and never spend your money before you actually have it in your bank account. Hard no. What? I know. What? I know. Don't spend that check before it actually clears the bank? Yeah. But and I got a closing coming in two days and it's a big closing. So I shouldn't go out and buy something to celebrate? No, and then you have to tell yourself, okay, you only have 50% of that, whatever comes to you after oh. your brokerage cuts, because 20% goes in your reinvest in your business, 30% yep. goes in taxes, then you take your 50% and divide it over your expenses, your, you know, whatever you do for charity or tithing or whatever else. So really, when you're coming in, 50% is all you're getting of that paycheck because you're 20% putting back in your business and 30% you're putting in your tax fund. You know what I, I'm loving so much about this conversation? It's all business. You, <laughs> I mean, not all, right? Because right before we jumped on, you said that your team, what you do excellent is customer service. And that's why you have a team and that's why you played a team member's strengths. But for you, it's you're looking at it like a business. Houses just happen to be the product that you sell. But you're sitting here talking about, you know, your priorities, <clears throat> you put those priorities on your team members, right? Like, don't you dare, you joined us for a reason. Don't you dare take time away from your family to write a contract. We got you, we'll help you. You're talking about your numbers. You're talking about the expenses. You're talking about the emotions. What else you got? Talking about really good stuff. Um, I'm trying to think of what, what did we talk about before we hopped on? Um, you don't. Fruit. That's fascinating because I, uh, that's usually a big part of other people's businesses is just the recruiting, but more is not always better. Having 20 agents is not always better. Now I want a core that is so cohesive and we're still growing. We set stretch goals. We said, uh, interestingly enough, we actually every year don't want to do more transactions. We want to do a higher volume. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's never our goal. We are not a team that you're going to see 200 and some odd, 50 transactions a year. I'm not running around. And I'm not saying we sell investment properties. We do everything. But overall, as, as you can imagine, home prices have gone up. We Our average transaction has gone up. Last year with COVID, you would think, oh my gosh, you know, that just hit. Well, we went back to work May 3rd and we were back in homes working full time. We did more transactions between July 1st and January 1st than we ever have. We had more on the books at December 30, July, January 1st of 2021 than we ever have in the past. So, you know, we were teeing up. There are two things that I think come into play 
right now, you know, obviously the inventory is a very hard thing. First time home buyers is very hard. So being a veteran agent of how we did things five years ago has, I'm glad I got into it 10 years ago when homes six months to a year, they were on the market. Yeah. Yeah. You did not want a listing. You wanted a buyer. Well, now that that's a hundred percent flipped now, but on the flip side of it, it allowed me to have the time to really learn the contracts and all of that. And that's what I would tell new agents is you need to read, read a lot and memorize every one of those clauses, know it back and forth, study the contract. And then the other thing, having a mentor, whether you're on a team or not, someone that can explain the nuances of what does this mean in a contract? And our job right now, one of the things that I think agents do as a huge disservice is putting out on social media how stinking easy it is. Oh my goodness. When we're saying, sold this in one hour, nine offers, tell them, I have, if you have a property and let's say the average contract is 40 pages long with the base contract, the counter offer, the seller's disclosure, I have 10 offers. I have 400 pages to review in a two hour span. You tell me and notice every single nuance of every difference in every one of those contracts. You better be on your game. Because it's not just about the price. No. And you're talking about what are appraisal waivers? What are inspection waivers? How are those things in other parts of the country getting your rear end in trouble where you're getting your clients sued? You need to know every single part of that. And it's a strategy. And the funny thing is my husband's assessment is he goes, this is a high stakes chess game. Oh. And he goes, and you're playing it on eBay because the highest bidder wins. It's all based. It's a live eBay with a high take. And if I do this, what does this party do? And what are the, what do you do say? And what do you don't, what do you withhold or not don't say to give away your card or your next move? So there's a lot involved in it. And just because you have multiple offers in a short period of time means that you're taking a week or two weeks worth of work that you did five years ago. You literally have to do it in a 24 hour period. When I tell you the top of your head's gonna blow off or, and it's the wild, wild west, you have to be lightning fast with the way you are thinking, responding, and actually also thinking about what you don't say to give away your client's advantage or position. So I tell people stop dumbing down our profession because if I post on social media 25 times, I sold this in two hours, I sold this in two days with 11 offers, I did this, I did that, under contract, poof. What does that say to the client? Or the general public. The you, expectations, that's right. Well, the expectations, but also, I don't need an agent. It doesn't nah, matter. I can do this. It's yeah. so easy. Yeah. I and mean, could you even imagine, <clears throat> I'm amusing myself here. Could you even imagine a for sale by owner putting their house up and getting six contracts in one day? Let's just go with six, only six contracts in one day. I say some things to my team, which I don't to clients <laughs> or FISBOS, but I will tell you, if you had your own flyers, you have, it is a better gamble for you to do your own dental work because your teeth are only worth like what tops 25 grand, pull them all out with a pair, a pair of priors, but your house might be worth $400,000, buy new teeth and hire an agent for your house. That's crazy. Absolutely. And, then, and you know, I'm just saying, on average, 88% of your buyers come with an agent, so they want their own advocate. So you as a homeowner are dealing with someone who does know the inside and that contract. And then secondly, eight houses sell at such a percentage higher when they're listed and marketed properly that you cover your commissions. And B, you have a layer of protection now, like I said, in the wild, wild west of errors and omissions insurance that covers you a lot. Now we're telling sellers, we have to know all of the information about your house to protect you. Don't withhold anything that could possibly get you in trouble. And we go over that, meaning a plumbing leak, this, that, the other. Oh, I did call my insurance company 18 months ago and I didn't make that repair. Hmm. 
Forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> Forgot about that. Yeah. So things like that, where I think one of the disservices agents do to themselves is devalue the amount of expertise that we have. I'm starting to see a little more of it than before. And I think people on social media, agents on social media are trying to be very careful not to vent or come across as negative, but I always shake my head like I nod in agreement a little bit when a, a listing agent will say, yes, I, I know it's frustrating that I didn't get back to you within two hours or whatever, but in this market though, just like you said, time is just condensed. So let's go back to 10 years ago. I know it seems like forever, but that would have been uh, 2011, but even just a little bit further than that. So right now, if you list a house for sale, right? Somebody puts their house on the market for all of you newer agents, you've got like a 99% chance of selling that house. It, it, that's how things are. You stick the sign in the yard, not devaluing you whatsoever, but you have a very high, high chance of selling that house. Well, not too long ago, 10, 12 years ago, you put a sign, you do all the work, all the staging, all the paperwork, you stick the sign in the yard and you had a 25% chance of getting that property to closing. And so what, what Mary was talking about, the high highs and the high lows and houses being on the market and it took several months. And, and if you got a contract within the first month, that was amazing. You were super happy about that. And it's what I love about you, Mary, is you have been through both of the markets. Yes. So that's what I love when you talked about the emotional part of it. I'm like, yes, it is such a roller coaster. And everybody wants to think about themselves and their clients. But man, there's two sides of it. Being Listing a property is just as intense as having a buyer who wants to buy a property. And that is not how it used to be. This is not normal. This is not normal. No. And, and the other thing that I think of is becoming, not dialing down the emotion, but being very communicative on multiple levels. When you're in that situation of you're the listing agent and you have 11 offers or, you know, you're just, your phone is blowing up. I've learned some things, you know, the day of the week that you list the home on, you know, trying to, you know, be aware of, um, you know, things coming in, always having a backup phone number on the MLS. So, you know, obviously when I list a property, Tina's name is on there too. She's gone through the property. She knows exactly so that she can help answer phone calls, but being really communicative when you have 33 voicemails in two hours, that you're on the MLS and you're saying multiple offers coming in. I mean, post on public platforms that, you know, what you send out a notification to every agent that has shown that we have a shine time system where we book the appointments, we can communicate back. And so I, you know, when waiting signatures, I want to be really conscientious of people's time too. I mean, our team has a philosophy of how to do the offers. I mean, at some point, there's no point in having 25 offers on a home. Right, right. You're just waste, You're just getting people's hopes up at that point. Yeah. And it's, too, it's actually completely confusing. You know, having conversations prior to listing with your clients about how does the appraisal pay, you know, come into play on this and where can we close this? that you're going to be satisfied even if it goes over because there's so many overages and how does the appraisal play into that? So we have, a, you know, something that's in place to protect the buyer. So again, that's a lot of training on those items, but being really communicative. And one of, one of my peeves is I know that we need to text, but when I, when my clients have chosen an actual buyer, on, if I'm on the selling side or I represent a buyer, and we are the ones that won in the market saying, okay, going forward, I mean, this, these conversations are worth tens of thousands of dollars to our clients. Mm -hmm. Please, please, please. There's layers of communication and you know this, like you and I can see each other right now. So that face-to-face -face obviously is the best. That's how I like to present multiple offers to my clients whenever possible. 
so that I can go through all the nuances with them. Sometimes that takes two hours when you have multiple offers. But face-to-face -face communication, when you can't, a phone call, you can hear someone's voice, you can hear the tone. A text can be taken snarky or not because I just infer the emotion that comes through with it. I might say, sure, Jessica, I agree with you. And that might sound like, sure, Jessica, I agree with you. Because <laughs> I'm reading it in my emotion, through my yeah. emotions. Yep, exactly. And, and so I really try to avoid negotiating thousands of dollars via text. I might, you know, to me, a text, and maybe it's my age, is I'll be there in 10 minutes. I will call you as soon as I'm available. I'm in a meeting right now. Now, phone call. Hey, Jess, when can we hang out? Yeah, want to <laughs> go to coffee next yeah. week. But on the flip side of that, you know, negotiating, replacing a roof you know, a, I don't know, 10 to $15,000 item negotiating. Okay. Our appraisal did not come back at the sales price. What would we like to do? These are conversations. And again, after the conversation, you send a follow-up email and you can text. I've sent you an email regarding this to follow up from our phone conversation, but really people understand your heart. They can hear the tone of your voice. And you could communicate and do a recap at the end of a phone conversation because the goal is always the same. It All we need to do is get the parameters around it because the seller wants to let go of this home and the buyer wants it. So all we need, we have a common goal here is the transfer of the property. We need to make parameters or boundaries around that that both parties can live with. You can do that in a conversation. You, I, you can work through any type of problem in a conversation. So when I get texts that we'll take $10,000 off the sales price, I back up. Before. Can we talk about this? Let's yeah. talk. Let's see what we, we can work and let me have a conversation. Is it more work or time? Yes. Is it worthwhile? Because those are thousands and thousands of dollars. Okay. But you just said, is it more work and time? It's, it's you're dealing with people's, the biggest financial decision of most people's lives. Absolutely. It's there. It's there. And I agree. Some agents, they just want to text and they just want to email. And I'm like, okay, can you have a conversation for your client? A, have a conversation with your client and then have a conversation for your client. Yes, absolutely. And I will tell you, almost every Friday now, especially in the summer, I'm not having happy hour. Because you know I'm what? Sorry. Call I'll me. Come over. Yeah, people call me about <laughs> homes. I can't tell you how many times I've been at the lake with my husband's family, not drinking, and they'll look at me. You can't even have one glass of wine. And I'm like, this is worth tens of thousands of dollars. Absolutely not. When I know that that is coming up, or I have to call a teammate and say, Tina, I've had two glasses of wine and now I need to take care of this. Please make a call on my behalf to be so conscientious about being an advocate for either party, your buyer or seller is super, super important. And I just, I feel really strongly about when you spend the time making those phone calls and having those conversations, it actually saves you time from trying to, you know, negotiate or cancel contracts or, starting over because there are times that you cannot get a transaction and those parameters around that set and there are times that transactions fall apart but we can save a whole lot more of them and save us time down the road if we communicate well around the the issues that come up whether it be at negotiation time to get it under contract or whether it be at inspection time or appraisal time those are the three big you have the better conversations and the more communicative you are with dialed down emotion, the better it's going to be and save the transaction so it does get to closing. So, I mean, invest a little more time in the beginning to save some at the end. So I want to talk about your team for a minute, if you don't yeah. mind. They are awesome. They're way better than I am. <laughs> yeah, my team is too. I'm like, I'm your assistant. You guys are so good. So when you came back after those 90 days, I'm fascinated with those 90 days, but when you came back from those 90 days and you said, all right, I'm all in, did you know you were going to build a team? No, 
I just knew I was going to take the next step. So when did that start to come about? Like, oh, okay, I guess, guess, guess we're having a team. Yeah, I would have to look back and see exactly what year Shelby joined us. So the first one that reached out to Tina was Shelby. Her daughters, they played soccer, and Shelby's husband is a lender. He's one of our uh, preferred lenders. We have great relationships with a, no a number of lenders. And um, we use Tyler Baker. We use Richard Laborvo, Supreme Lending. We love Nutter Home Loans. We have our own loan officer there. And Charlie Tipton at A1 Markage is amazing. So his wife um, came, approached Tina and said, I'd like to go into real estate. I've been in the mortgage side and I'd like to get in the real estate side. So, you know, we interviewed her. We're kind of like, hey, you want a team member? We're like, sure. So that kind of came, just kind of came to us. Shelby is an amazing addition, but we weren't even, we've never, you know, sought out and said, oh, we need to add another person here. It's been more of people approaching us, coming to us. You know, we've had interviews with people that we kind of see how they respond after we've taken them to coffee or lunch. I mean, the follow-up is essentially, if somebody interviews with us and we never hear from them again, they're a hard no. Because you know oh, what they're that's doing? interesting. Like, oh, how did yeah. they follow up with you? Oh, yeah. That's the same thing if I go to somebody's house and list an appointment. If I walk out that door and don't call that person again for that job interview, hard no. Hmm. So we've, we've maybe I would say no more than three to five times we've taken somebody. We don't hear from them after we've taken them to lunch. Thumbs down. Hmm. That's a self-elimination. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Again, you're a professional. It's not like building it by. So I think it appears on the surface like you're you're saying, oh, I we basically built it by default, right? I'm using a little air quotes, built it by default because you didn't have specific parameters and targets around that. But you legitimately interviewed her. You you're not people come to you and go, oh, hey, Mary, I want to join your team. You're not like, oh yeah, come on. You're like, we're going to go to coffee. We're going to talk. We're all going to talk about what your goals are, what you're looking for, what your values are, how you handle your business. You're not just like some puppy pound. And then you're not right there like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go. You're like, okay, well, let's, you know, let's oh. see if they continue to date us. Yeah, exactly. And then after that, if they did follow up, they have to do a disc assessment. We need to, we are, when I say we are slow to hire, we're looking for personality traits. We're looking at how well, you know, they mesh with the other disc personality that we have on our team. I mean, we're looking for, are they a team player? Are they, do we sense competitiveness? And we also even did this with our admin. Our current team gets to interview the new team member. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if they're going to mess with the mojo, and ruin the squad and I'm the one that calls it the squad I say I am the squad is first there you know I I love the squad and that's who we're promoting and that's so that way there's no you know hierarchy yes Tina and I lead the team but I will tell you that the squad is you know is the most important and the highest value to us you're like so, the moms, right? You're the moms. You make the decision. You look out for everybody, but they all matter equally, and it's all yes. for the good of the team. And you're yes. looking out for them. You absolutely have your team's back, every single member. Yes, and I had a client. I had one client that it was Alethea's client. Alethea was out of town. They, I took them out several times, and she was gone for like a five-day, I don't know, five- to seven-day vacation check them out and they said something about her and I also knew which was not true I fired yeah. the client they're not gonna lie about my teammate no no and no. you know what and I'm like and just there were a number of different things they were having a very difficult time making decision but I just said you know what? I don't think that we are the best team to serve you and I think that you would be better served by going to a, to another team or another agent. Okay. So that is mind blowing to some people. And I want to camp out there for just a second, because if you haven't fired yourself from a client, not, oh my gosh, you're the worst client ever. I hate you. Don't ever call me again or ghosting them. That doesn't count either. But if you are a true professional 
you have had, here's the line that I use. I just don't think I'm going to be able to get you to your end goal. Your goals are important. I just don't think I'm the agent to get you to that end goal. Yeah. If you have not had to fire yourself, if you don't know how to fire yourself, um, you like, are you even really trying? <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm like, we, our thing is do not do bad business. Don't do it. Just point blank. Don't do it. And I have, I have one person that I will tell you, I've done a, a, an investor that did not want to do disclosure. I'm like, I am not the right agent for you. I know that you I really appreciated working for you. Uh, you know, I am not the right person for you going forward. And I just think it would be better if we end our business relationship here. I wish you all the best. I just don't feel like I can meet your goals and your expectations. Done. Right. Yeah, because, and, it, and I don't even wanna say, oh, well, it's not, it's not me, it's them. It's not them, it's me. It's just not a good fit and that's okay. And just like with you were talking about with your team members, if you release them, they will be able to go and find someone who's a good fit because once you do a transaction with them and they're your past client, like you can decide not to return their phone calls again, but that is always a transaction that you had a part of just exactly like you said, don't do bad business. And you were a part of that bad business. I, it, it, I, and we're not talking about the nightmare deals like, oh, we found him the house and then everything went wrong. And that happens, right? That happens to everybody. But so how do you, I just really honestly have so many questions. So I, well, I love like, you're like, I'm at the lake. I'm not drinking because I might have to negotiate a contract and. <laughs> oh, but when I tell you. Lose with my mouth. <laughs> Well, and here's when I tell you, I might not drink Friday night and then Saturday I get it signed by one o'clock, honey, I'm making up. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> because what I know about you is that you live all of the areas of your life abundantly. You have so much fun. And when something comes along that shakes your boat a little, you're like, all right, all right. I know you to handle your emotions in your personal life the same way you handle your emotions in your professional life. And, and that's, one, thing, fun. that's one of the things I love about you. And okay, so, yes, go ahead. I said, you have to make things fun and you have to be able to laugh at yourself. It's so. not, the agents are gonna burn out, right? That's why, they, that's why they get in 18 months and they're like, I hate this, I don't wanna do this, I never wanna do this again. Okay, well, <laughs> you're burning out. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about for an agent, right? Cause you've been there for an agent who is right around maybe $5 million. And on this podcast, 5 million is an excellent amount. Like that's a big deal to me, honestly, but let's say that they want to go to 10 million. Like they want to double everything. Let's say they're a single agent, right? They've been doing it for a couple of years. They're a single agent. But now they're like, all right, I'm 100% in. I want to I wanna double this. And they want to go from 5 million to 10 million. What, what would be your advice? Um, I've, a couple of things. Uh, people ask me how I built my business mm -hmm. uh, initially, and especially those first five years. I got up before everybody else in real estate. I'll tell mm -hmm. you that. So when I had five kids at home, um, I was even an early riser, like 4.45 did my exercise, did my quiet time. I was at my office at 6 a.m., 6 a.m. button chair. I stayed here until noon. Then I went home because my kids were sleeping until 10 or 11, unless they had <laughs> teenagers. That's right. <laughs> so unless they had camp. So I was always home by noon. And then I already had six hours of work in. And most agents, this office doesn't fill up till like 11 after they work out at nine. And granted, there are, we do work evenings. So what I would do is give myself, I've already got all my computer work. I've already done all my follow-up emails. I've already planned for the week. I've already done, you know, what I need to do as far as following a system. So first of all, get yourself a system. Whether you follow a KW system or Remax Momentum Training, I just know those two. 
I, and I'm sure, you know, other brokerages have that, whether it's Reese Nichols or something else, follow their system and get a system in place. Get up before everybody else and get the stuff that you have to, every email you need to do, list making, reach out, handwritten notes, get it all done before business hours and get that out of the way. The things that you like to do the least, do those first. And so be ready. You can't cold call at 6 a.m., but I, when I would tell you if I needed a cold call, I was on the phone. You can start at 8.30. You can get them done before 10 a.m. Right. And then I would go home. I could still be a mom in the afternoon if I needed to go start, start showing houses at 4 o'clock, if I needed to show them at 6 o'clock after work, but I still had some mom time. I was home. I was, if I didn't make breakfast or I left it out or I made it the night before, I was still home for lunch. I was still home to drive my kids here or there. And then I'd say, today, mom's got to go back to work at four o'clock. And do I have, did I have to give up a lot of controlling my schedule? I had to, I had to let go of that. But I will just tell you that was what worked for me. And following a system, like I said, um, not until about three years ago did I go into real estate coaching. I think you have to get to a level of, you can work through your brokerage the first five years with maximize their training, um, following, you know, doing your social media class, which me, 11 years into real estate, I bought your class. Great training. <laughs> but, and but there's my friend plugging me again. Yeah. That's, you know, do something always being personal development, but Remax, I would think Reese Nichols, uh, you know, I'm a big advocate of following the systems. So I would tell you, uh, obviously I'm a big advocate for Remax. I'm waving bye-bye to my husband walking by the window. Bye honey. Yeah. But um, Remax has an amazing system for bringing on onboarding. They give you, you know, you need to work on four pillars of your business. My business is very heavily sphere related, but that's because I had a huge network before I got into real estate and then cultivating that and working that um, has been extremely financially lucrative for me. So I'm um, never ever losing touch with past clients, you know, things like that. So. At what point did you turn over the paperwork? I turned over the paperwork. The most, I still write my offers. I like to, yeah. because again, you know, my average client is a higher price point. I'm responsible now, secondary documents and all of that, but it, I feel strongly. I am the one responsible because my name is on that form. Right. Right. So, um, but what I mean is earnest but, deposit check copies to the uh, office that, during the contract. Uh, three and a half, maybe almost four years ago. The admin does all of that. And I'll, and even right now, I will say to Laura, we have an amazing admin, Laura, uh, client care coordinator, Laura Danner. I will say, Laura, you know, I need an amendment written. I will always review because again, the legal aspect of it, she's not in the house. Right. You know, she doesn't know the clients, but I will review it. But she does all of that. Uploading paperwork, sending it to our systems, compliance, auditing, all of that. Um, probably about four and a half years ago. And I had to look at what is the best usage of my time and time dollar per hour. And it's absolutely connecting with your people. Yeah, I am. And I will tell you, Tina's a systems IT person. I mean, former military. I cannot brag, division one athlete. I cannot brag on how intelligent. I'm the network, I'm the people person. I can talk to a fence post, obviously. <laughs> um, I could, I mean, literally, I think I could, you know, have a conversation with the cardboard box and probably sell them something. <laughs> I just, you know, so that's my strength. And so we look at our team. Shelby is really outgoing. She's got a huge network. She's super fun. She loves to travel. Her friends are really loyal to her. Noah is a millennium. He's a millennial. He's young. He brings in that tech aspect. Alethea is so service oriented and has a heart to care for people like I've never seen. Just amazing. Tina is such a smart woman and I'm fun. I will, I will get you lost if you're a buyer 
and I will make you laugh. So, you know, I, Andy has 25 years of construction knowledge. Phenomenal for people. As, you can walk into a home with him and he'd be like, yes, this wall can come down. No, they can't. It's like a little HGTV consultation every time you look at a house. Because his, he can look at the yard and be like, this, this house might be dry right now, but come May when it rains seven inches, it's going to have water in the basement. He can tell that in the dry week in October. Yeah. And, you know, so we each bring a different aspect and we really want to cultivate that. We want to support. You have to be aware of your weaknesses but you really need to play to your strengths. And that's, and our team runs the full gamut, but our core and value system is the same. And that's what we look for in the interview and that disc. But I think as a new agent, if you define your values, you define your core, you lean into your brokerage education. Obviously I'm an advocate of Remax, but you know, each brokerage will have their own. And then you seek out ways to play to your strengths and support your weaknesses. And you get to work, get to work before other people get to work. Get started. And don't be doing the things that you can do. If you can do them in off hours, do them in off hours. And we're not talking about, just like Mary was saying, we're not talking about sacrifice your family or don't go to your kid's ball game because you're trying to do something. She's just talking about she gets more out of the day because while you're sleeping or piddling around with your coffee or whatever she's on purpose getting things done yeah and then be hardcore about protecting your time off sunday is non-negotiable for me Mm. some you know what i don't work on sundays i don't do open houses on sundays i don't answer my phone on sunday i don't check my email on sunday the people that say, oh, you should plan for your week Sunday night. I do that Saturday morning. Saturday morning is when you do it? Yep. I don't do it on Sunday. I do laundry. I love to cook. I loved being a housewife. I didn't see anything that needed. I So for me, that's relaxing. Last Yesterday, it was a cool day. I had wedding things with my daughter who's getting married this fall. And then I watched two episodes of Longmire. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I won't watch any TV again until probably next Sunday. I do like TV. I was watching something on the History Channel, like the Titans of the uh, that started it all or something. And my 12 year goes, "Are you really watching this?" And I was like, "Yes, I'm fascinated with history, like <laughs> Carnegie and Rockefeller and Schwab. I love all that. Fascinated. Fascinated <laughs> with anyway, you. Thank you so much." I absolutely love you. All of the different ways for you to connect with Mary will be in the show notes. Mary, thank you so much for being on the Lady CEO podcast. Until next time, everyone. All right, Mary, say goodbye. Goodbye. And I would definitely recommend Jessica's book and her social media training. And if you're lucky enough to just be girlfriends with her, that's pretty cool too. (laughs) All right, everyone. Until next time. Thank you.